minor miracle is mounted by the fact that there are no injuries spread among the near hysterical crowd. This truly is a social document for our time. What interests me? How do I pick my subjects? They very often come from little clippings I see in a, a newspaper or something, and I've always kept clippings of things that interested me. I just cut them out. I put them, I have files of these things. And if I find I get quite a lot of them, I think, well, that's interesting. I think it was McCullen who, who actually said that David was interested in tinsel society. I found it much more fun looking at something like ballroom dancing, you know, which m masses of people do. But I was fascinated to find out why they wanted to do it. I just wanted to go and photograph simple things that people did honestly. Most of my life is what I call seeing, looking, and recording. My name is David Hearn, and I'm a photographer. With Magnum since 1965, the Welsh photographer rediscovered his homeland after years traveling around the world, exploring dance halls, remote villages, English suburbs, and Hollywood sets. A photographer on a continuous quest for new ventures and answers to everyday questions. David Hearn's photo features are portraits of daily life full of creativity and curiosity a glowing career starring in the Hungarian War of 1956. If you see somebody hanging upside down by their feet and somebody kicking them, uh, it doesn't take much to think that that's worth photographing, you, you know, in terms of... So I, I shot these pictures. They got me out of Budapest. And, uh, you know, I had one picture published in in European edition of, of life and then pictures get distributed around and there, a few pictures were picked up by Picture Post and, and the Observer and um, and I'd suddenly found myself leaping to the top of the ladder you, you know and so you cling on like mad. The year is 1964, and at the top of the European charts are the songs of a group that more than any other reflects the vital energy of this new decade. These are the Beatles. Their music, breaking the bounds of convention, is lively and authentic. Their lyrics, simple and carefree, tell about common, everyday desires and disappointments. Their voices blend into harmonies and create effects that are irresistible. With Please Please Me, they achieve success. With She Loves You, they set the absolute record for sales. With I Want to Hold Your Hand, in February 1964, they lifted the American spirit, suffering from Great Depression, shaking up the sounds on the other side of the pond. Well, I met them all uh, doing the film The Hard Day's Night. 
which was a movie really based on their music, um, loosely written around the music. And um, to be honest, I didn't really know that much about them. It hadn't been a particular, they hadn't been a particular interest to me. So it was really an assignment, to be honest. It's only in hindsight that you look back, or I look back, and realize how extraordinary these songs were. Dick Lester, the director, did this very strange thing, which, uh, I mean, in hindsight was ludicrous, um, was that decided to shoot the whole thing on a, on a train. So they hired a train, and every morning they, we all got on the train and went from Mar Marylebone in, uh, down to the west coast and then stopped and then came back again and it was one of those old-fashioned trains which you wouldn't have seen but it had sort of individual compartments of which four people could sit opposite four people now I mean they're very tiny and and if you had the four Beatles usually in there with a film crew and a director um, the last person they wanted in there was somebody with a still camera you know So the train had to stop at certain times and, and I elected to leap out and, and to try and do pictures. I had to be very careful that I could get back on the train, otherwise it would be gone. So I have quite a lot of pic pictures like this of, of um, the crowds, you know, this adoration thing. I found that much more interesting, um, frankly, than the, them themselves. Crowds of frenzied fans will follow the group every time they go out in public. Amidst screams and scenes of delirium, the music of the Beatles amplify a social phenomenon and fad that will come to be known as Beatlemania. The advent of the group coincides with the fall of the British Conservative Party during the years when the liveliness of the youth market and employment bring about a consumption boom and all caution and moderation are thrown out the window. The music of the Liverpool Fab Four brings British pop culture to the fore all over the world, not only for its musical sounds, but also creating an authentic inspirational model. Remember, I would go out in the car and I'd drive my car, and, and if they were in the car with me, you could not stop at a red traffic light. If you stopped at a red traffic light, you were mobbed. So we learned that you just had to go through the traffic lights and the police, if they saw you, they'd let you through, you, you, you know. I mean, it, it is extraordinary. I, I mean, why these people are not terrified, I have no idea. Because mobs of people become extraordinary. Visually, uh, people, you know, went and cut their hair like the Beatles did. Um, they wore suits, but I would have thought no more than, say, the Rolling Stones. It's just that you had a different type of audience, so that if you went and saw the Beatles, I've always felt that the audience was visually almost like going to a Billy Graham meeting. It was almost like a religious fervor, whereas if you went to the Rolling Stones, it was a much more sexual kind of audience. The, the fervor was a sexual thing. And, and with the more famous groups, I, I, I think you could, you could see that. I, I suppose I like the aggressiveness of the, the Stones more than the Beatles. Uh, again, people don't realize that the Beatles were the tidy ones. They were the ones that mums quite liked. You know, they, they by and large wore suits and, 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 and things. And, and, and even if they're their hair was a little bit long, it was tidy long. You, you, you know, they didn't look like roughnecks, etc. They were fun to me, etc. And they had very distinct personalities. I, I got on with uh, Ringo more than any of them. I, I think because I, I guess his background was more me. Uh, Paul, I, uh, Paul was strange. Paul was slightly aloof. John was obviously the bright, brainy one. Uh, and George was interested in being the greatest musician in the world. I mean, he was the one that really played well and went out of his way to learn to play 
better and better. From the moment you meet him, David Hearn conveys a sense of instant friendliness and total trust. He must have charmed the Beatles with his spirit, like what took place over the following years with his portraits of great stars such as Clint Eastwood, Ursula Andress, Sean Connery, and Jane Fonda, whom he followed during the shooting of Barbarella. David Hearn soon made a name for himself, motivated by a passion for photography that was kindled during his military service at the Sandhurst Academy. At Sandhurst, obviously, there was a kind of indoctrin indoctrination, is, is, is too big a word, but, um, you know, you were kind of taught that all Russians eat their children, basically, and, and they're all very nasty people and, and they, they are enemies, etc., etc. Et Whilst I was there, I was, I was looking through some Pitch Post magazines that were there, and, and I saw um, a series of photographs over, I think, over four issues I've got, but, but this is the key one. Basically, um, what we had was a, a series of pictures called the camera in Russia. And, 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 and uh, this is, I think, issue three of the four. Um, it turns out, in hindsight, they were photographed by somebody called Henri Cartier-Bresson. They look real. They looked as though, hang on, this is a Russia that looks not that different. The people in these pictures don't look that different. During the Second World War, my father was away, he was in the army. When he came back in 45, was it? I remember that the first thing he did was to take my mother and me in tow to Howells in Cardiff, which is a big department store, and he bought her a hat. And it was one of my really joyous memories, was the love between my father and my mother, and the whole act of buying the hat was obviously a joyous thing. Imagine my surprise when in the picture, a uh, picture post, down in the corner here is a picture of a Russian army officer buying his wife a hat. I remember distinctly when I saw that picture, I started to cry and cry seriously because it brought back that first joyous memory. And I believed in this picture. I really believed in this picture. This to me was much more important than anything I was being told about Russia. This seemed authentic. And literally, I, I mean, it's so stupidly romantic. But I did at that moment say to myself, that's what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. I want to go and photograph officers buying their wives hats or the equivalent. From the past, I'd, I'd done a book on a hundred people in Wales that I thought were um, enriched my life, I, I said at that time. And one of them was um, a milliner, a hat maker uh, called Alison Todd. And they're wonderfully extravagant and over the top. And there's something slightly surreal about in the, in the middle of Wales, this woman making this exotic hat uh, and, and she has always has this wonderfully, um, these very young assistants who all look as though they've been to finishing school and, and they're, they're so polite and they're so confident and, and they're elegant. And
During a pause in the filming of the movie, on April 16, 1964, the Beatles record the song that will give the film its name. The phrase had been uttered by Ringo Starr at the end of a taxing day of filming. Instead, the song had been penned hurriedly by Lennon at their hotel as a response to the success of Can't Buy Me Love, composed by McCartney, which was already at the top of the international charts. The opening chords of the song will forever remain one of the cornerstones of their musical legend. The album, the first to contain only original songs, will confirm the power of the Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership. The film will be a solemn tribute to the Beatlemania phenomenon. Is, is there a visual relationship between the fans and the Beatles? Because um, the fans are out of control, in a way, and the Beatles are, in theory, under contr control. And, and, and so, in a way, you have that tension between the famous and the people that are trying to be connected to the famous in some way. His passion for music will enable David Hearn not only to catch original, private moments and characteristics of the Beatles, but will also guide him in later works, such as his famous photo feature on the Isle of Wight Pop Concert in 1969, an event where music and emancipation are brought together in his color shots with a brilliant, slightly ironic style. The Isle of Wight Pop Concert was, you know, Bob Dylan coming over. It was a pretty obvious thing to go to in any case. It was slightly posher for me because at that time I was extremely friendly with Jane Fonda, you, you know. Um, and so we flew in by helicopter, <laughs> which is a pretty grand way uh, to be there, which meant that, you know, one was backstage and all that sort of st stuff. Um, and, and then I did a professional job. I, uh, you know, I didn't just sit down and listen to the music, I, I photographed. when everybody's on the beach and suddenly somebody decided to take their clothes off and, and then everybody took their clothes off and, and, and it was really funny because the camera crews <laughs> felt embarrassed uh, uh, to be filming with everybody with their clothes out so they all had to take their clothes off so you had this wonderful thing. Once again, he responds to his instinct, which takes him into the right situation in a privileged position, as had already happened a few years earlier in the studios on Abbey Road, when, during a break, the Beatles found themselves all together around a piano, studying the lyrics of a song as Hearn's camera clicks around them. If you're on an assignment, uh, or, or I guess if you're not on, a, if you're on a self-assignment, one of the things that you have to think about is, is, is what is the key picture that you know you have to get. In the case of the Beatles, you have four people, and and it's obviously important that you have all four of them at some point in the picture. And not only do you have all four in the picture, you need to be able to see, recognise all four. Of them. And I arrived at the studio where they were not only recording music, which is Abbey Road Studio, the famous studio, but they were also going through on the piano, talking about music and the script, etc. And, and, and I realised that the four of them were there together and, and, and therefore I was searching, searching, searching for this thing. And they go into the studio and they're round the piano. And, and I'm just having to move six inches to the left, six inches to the right, trying to get the four of them into some kind of geometric design which projects a kind of feeling. That's what you're doing all the time. It con pictures are about content. 
and then out of that happens to come what we call styles. So you're moving around all the time trying to get it. But when you look at these very subtly, it becomes pretty obvious to me that this is the clearest picture that works as a geomet geometric design. And I suppose it's become, iconic is a really overused word, but it's become a very well-known Beatles picture. I think because nobody else has pictures of them in that natural situation, which work quite as well as this particular picture. Um, and so it's become for older generations of people when they make lots of money, it's been one of the pictures that sells as, in inverted commas, an art print, you know. It's the picture, picture from the whole thing I was doing that I needed. And, and you can see how difficult it is to do because there's one on it, you know. And That same attention to detail that will mark the future of the Beatles will accompany Hearn in all his works, until the main, but above all existential, photography turning point. Wales, the land of his father, where he moved in the early 1990s. He will not only renew distant ties, but will find meaning in the traditions, times, and colors that form the local lives and culture. I was in Wales, my country, and that we very often talk about Welsh culture. And I, I, I said to myself, what, what is Welsh culture? So I thought I would try to explore what the word culture means to me. So I thought that I'm a photographer. If I just went and photographed them within these things, Perhaps I would end up with a jigsaw puzzle called a book, and, and that would be for me what is my culture. I made the choice that I would prefer to meander around Wales most of my life. And so when I get up in the morning, you know, what do I do? I come back, I, I put on a CD and I listen to some, somebody that I, somebody that's enriched my life. And, and I enjoy making coffee. I, I enjoy the fact that uh, the best is, it takes 21 seconds for the coffee to come through. And, and that's very scientific in a way because related to the dark room where you put a negative in and you, you put light through it for a very precise amount of time. It's that scientific thing of getting the balance of everything right. And I've always enjoyed that sort of trying to get that balance right. Mm -hmm. 